Hugh Hefner, a true American icon, created an empire that was unrivaled. Although some of us bunnies may have gone rogue, it's because of the love and respect that we received from the man behind it all. Because after all, we did learn from the best. Relive the stories from the most prominent celebrity home in history. What happens in the grotto stays in the grotto. From those of us that lived it. The employees that worked it. And the guests who loved it. And the the mayhem continues. All right, here we are, Rogue Bunnies Mayhem. Ladies, it's okay. just What's us. Up? <laughs> <laughs> so we've been talking about wanting to do a show like this for a long time. You know, I don't really read all of the comments, but sometimes, you know, you, you see one or two and they ask kind of questions like, what's up with you guys? How did you even get started and all that stuff? So we thought we'd take the chime to uh, kind of like tell our backstories. Take the chime. Okay. Take the chime. <laughs> <laughs> So, Victoria, um, we told the story about how this all got started, how Rogue Bunny Mayhem came about. We've talked about the NFT project. But, you know, all of us come from a world of Playboy, right? Mm -hmm. Let's tell your personal story. Well, I got I I went to play. I got to Playboy when I was uh, 23 and I had actually already tried out for Playboy. I had went with a girlfriend to a, um, actually I had first sent in pictures when I was like 20 or 21 or something like that. And I went to the mall and did those glamour shots that are like really awful where they're, it's, they were awful. They Feather were, really please tell me there was a, and I boa. was holding a captain <laughs> hat and it's dazzled. It was, you know, and it's all blown out and the makeup is like really white around your eye. The makeup artist was awful it was before I had braces too. So I had these, my teeth were kind of crooked, whatever. And so I took the pictures and I sent them in and um, I waited and I got, I had the letter sent to my mom's house because I was moving around and stuff. And I wasn't sure where I was going to be. And she called me and she says, I got the letter from Playboy. And I was like, Oh really? It's so excited. And she goes, well, um, I was like, Oh, that doesn't sound good. So she read it. And this is how it went. I don't think you are aware, but there are many uh, women that, you know, try out for Playboy and you're just not attractive enough. What? Yeah, that was the letter. <laughs> and, um, and, and so I never actually saw the letter. So I don't know if my mother just put those words in there. Cause I was oh, thinking, oh, that was- like to stop you. Like, okay, this is over. Yeah. Like, just forget about it. You're like, okay, <laughs> let's put it off, you know? So, and of course I cried. I was like, oh my God. And I was like, I was like, oh my God, it was like hurt so bad. And so a couple of years later I had, I was doing bikini contests and stuff. And I went with a girlfriend who was a bikini model or whatever. And she said, go with me. And I was like, okay. So we went down and she's standing in line and they say, I think it was Stephen Wada, maybe even, I can't remember, said to me um, at a cattle call, oh, you should take pictures. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no. And so she didn't get in and I didn't take any pictures because I didn't want to overshadow her on her day or whatever. And I had already been turned down. I didn't want another turn down. And then um, she had a job for like a box cover and she couldn't show up for this box cover. And so she said, oh, you should go because they need a blonde. And so I went. And so the makeup artist was Alexis Vogel. And Alexis Vogel is like the master. Oh, Alexis is really cool. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. I had never had my makeup done before like that or worn lashes or any of that stuff. So she did my makeup and I remember looking in the mirror and being like, oh my God, like, <laughs> holy crap, you know, like <laughs> next level. <laughs> and so um, we did that. We did the whole photo shoot and she said, I'm going to take a couple Polaroids of you. And um, I think you should do Playboy. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like I've already been down this road. And so she said, no, I have an in. And so she had taken them to Marilyn Gabowski that night. And uh, Marilyn Gabowski called me the next morning and was like, hi, Victoria, this is Marilyn. I'm, I'm the editor of Playboy. And I was like, yeah, right. Click. Because I thought it was <laughs> a joke. I thought someone's messing with me because everybody knew I wanted to be in Playboy or whatever. And that I was so sad that I didn't. And then I thought, God, I didn't even tell anybody I did that photo shoot. I wonder that's really strange. And then Stephanie called me, who was her assistant at the time and called me and she said, hi, Victoria, it's not a joke where, you know, we'd really like to see you. So I called Alexis and I said, they called me and she goes, I know I told you. And I was like, oh my God, what do I do? She goes, white t-shirt, jeans, lip gloss, mascara, nothing else, hair in a ponytail, you know, just go as natural as you can. I was like, okay. 
And um, so I did. I showed up like that. And th they they gave me a contract that day. Marilyn's like, oh, here's a contract. You know, we would like you to be playmate. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't even read it. Stupid, right? <laughs> <laughs> filling out the thing on my life. You just my find life. it right away. Boom. Oh yeah. Like, well, I was, well, I tried to read some of it, but it was like pages long. I'm like, Phew. oh yeah. I mean, what could be in there? That's like going to tell you, no, I mean, come on. They own you basically. Right. Like they own you and your images and whatever, which, what am I going to say? No. And then they'd be like, bye. You signed and, away your uh, firstborn portrait. She doesn't know yet. She has no <laughs> clue. So yeah. So I did my photo shoot right away. I got into the photo shoot. So that was it. I did the photo shoot and then they were have they were going to have me slated for January 1996 and or 95 and then they called and they're like, "Well, we're going to hold off and do January 1996." And I was like, "Oh my god, I'm going to have to wait a year and like a year and a half I waited." So it was the one of the longest waits that any of the girls ever had. And when you go into the office, they have the little it on the board and they kind of have the slots where the girls are. Cause they're like nine months in advance. So it's the girls before and the girls that are coming up and the, you know, like they kind of shuffle the girls around or whatever. And so my spot was all the way down here. And I was like, Oh no, that's like such a long time for them to change their mind. So I was really concerned. And then, and then I was shooting the, the video and I did all the stuff. And then um, they didn't even tell me that my magazine had come out. Like someone randomly called me and it's like, oh, I, I saw you. And I was like, what? And I ran down to the newsstand and I've told this story so many times because it was so humbling. So I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm hot shit. I'm in Playboy. I was so excited. I'm 23. My whole life's ahead of me. And like, it was a great, it was like winning the lottery. I was so excited. And so I go and I get the magazine and it's a, a younger guy at the newsstand. And I, I'm just in sweats and no makeup and everything. And I pull open the magazine. I'm like, well, what do you think of her? And he was like, eh, she's all right. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I realized. Well, maybe he liked brunettes. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe he didn't want to make a big deal and look like a creep or something. I don't know. Right. But, but it was so humbling because I was like, oh, that just proves that like, no matter what you look like, no matter how good you look, you're just not going to please everybody. So just keep it real, you know? So that was probably a good thing that happened. Cause then I had to like, bring it down. I was like, okay, I can't, can't be bragging about this because you know, like some people aren't going to think it's that great, but that was, uh, yeah, that was, that was my story on becoming a playmate. Yeah. It took a really long time. That must've been a hard wait too, because back then he was married. Right. So it wasn't like when I came about, you were already sort of ingrained in everything and you were, we were able to go up for movie nights and fun in the sun and all of that while we waited for our issue to come out. So you were just yeah. waiting. Yeah. And I lived at the mansion, I think it was like t just under two weeks. So I was in the guest house and I was never invited in the house. I was never invited to movie night or a dinner oh, or any of that oh. stuff. Mm -mm. And there was wow. no, do not talk. If you see him walk the other way, don't talk to Kimberly, you know, keep it like respectful. You know, he's married and you know, it's not cool if you, you know what I mean? Which, which, which made sense. I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. No problems. They have kids there whatever. But then Maren Gabowski invited me to the, like the studio Christmas party and, and then a dinner, a couple dinners. She kept inviting me out and Kimberly was at a couple of those things. And so I kind of got to know Kimberly. I, she was really sweet. And so I thought, Oh, well, she's not as scary as like, they're making it out to be <laughs> like, she hates everybody. She was actually really, really nice and um, very welcoming and, and, and super sweet. Yeah, that was my introduction into Playboy. And it wasn't until my issue came out and then it was New Year's Eve. I was invited to the New Year's Eve party, which was all black tie at that time at Mel Torme and, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. That's the first time I got to see Hef in person, like meet him in person. And of course, I was just like, <gasps> I wanted to talk to him so bad. But um, and I did. I did, you know, like, hi, I'm Victoria. And he's like, I know who you are, darling. And I was like, oh, my God, he knows who I am. <laughs> Like, this is so weird because I had grown up with seeing him on TV. He was super iconic to me. And I don't know what it was that I, I instantly, at nine years old, I instantly made this connection that like he seemed so familiar and like, but I also thought he was Howard Hughes, the richest man in the world. And so like, I had always had it in my head that I got to work for this guy because he's roller skating. He's the richest man in the world. He's got all these beautiful women around. He looked like he was having so much fun. So for me, like that was... I must have manifested it because I, that was like, well, that's just what I'm going to do. I'm going to be an artist and I'm going to be a bunny. And, and that was just what I was going to do. So when it finally happened, I was like, well, God, I was 
I can't believe it finally happened because, you know, that was my master plan for all those years. So when I was 23, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's weird. And the, whole world, and the whole world changed right from then. Yeah. I just think about what, I wonder what, you know, just my art career in, in specific, how that would have turned out because I had no idea how to break into an art career, how to get into a gallery. I mean, I was taking art classes in college. I went to Pierce college and I took some other classes just so I could, you know, I wanted to learn about art and become an artist and figure that out. And so like this, de being a playmate was definitely my lily pad, my launch pad to, to my art career. And obviously my licensing contract that, that Hef gave me early on was instrumental in me doing that. So I, I feel really lucky that that, that that even happened, you know, 12 girls a year. It's not, it's not easy mm -hmm. to get in. It was, it was pretty, it was a, really such a awesome, cool experience. Man. Yeah. I always felt so lucky. I always felt like, Ooh, I felt so chosen. Yeah. It really gave me a boost. You know what I mean? I didn't have, I didn't go through my twenties with a bunch of insecurities, except for when I started meeting all the girls. And then I was like, Oh, out of the 12, I'm not, you know, not the, not the one out of the 12. And Marilyn early on was like, in the beginning when I just became a playmate and she was like, Oh, we need a, we need someone like you for playmate of the year. And she kept talking about playmate of the year. And then a couple months in Victoria Silvestead walked through the studio doors. And was oh. like, yeah, yeah. I was like, Oh, I'm still here. Uh, but, um, but if there's anybody to lose to, you know, she's, she something. you know, she's, yeah, she's amazing. So yeah. Stunning, but so cool and down to earth. She's, she's amazing. She was so fun. She, she is fun. fun girl. She was. I, I worked with her a couple times. And of course, I always felt like a troll because I, I'm like five feet shorter than her. She's blonde. She's bl the lips and the eyes and the, the body and the legs. I mean, her legs for days. And so I'd walk in, I'd be like next to her or whatever. <laughs> Stop. And, and we, there was a dinner that we went to in like Atlanta or something like that. And she came in late. So I'm talking to all the guys and I was like all the rage, right? And then she walked in and they're like, no one talked to me for the rest of the night. I was like, I, I'm, uh, I'm just over here, total chop liver, and she probably gets that a lot. You know what I mean? She's she's just she's a magnet, you know. So what can you say? You have a funny story about Victoria, but if we're gonna have to take a quick break. Let's do that. Let's come right back. You are listening to Rogue Bunnies Mayhem. <laughs> Hi, it's Victoria Fuller, founder and lead artist of Rogue Bunnies, and more importantly, Miss January 1996. You should all know the story by now. Me and my hundred bunny sisters have gone rogue. What you need to do is visit roguebunnies.com. By purchasing your Rogue Bunnies NFTs, you can be part of our Discord community, which gets you early access to Rogue Bunnies series drops, special promotions, exciting IRL events, our famous poker nights, and so much more. All you have to do is visit roguebunnies.com. That's R-O-G-U-E-B-U-N-N-I-E-S.com. Let's explore the future together. Welcome to the metaverse. Hi, this is Angel Boris, Miss July 1996, and you're listening to Rogue Bunnies Mayhem. You know, you, we were talking about Victoria Silstead, and I got a funny story because when I first started as a butler, uh, we all had the rules of where you had, you were allowed to go where you were not allowed to go. And whenever you entered a room, you always had to knock and then you waited to hear if you heard anything. Then you knocked again and then you'd creak the door open and you'd yell out Butler, you know, so that way, yeah, you know, if there was any lady in there, Hey, someone's about to come in. So I was doing property check and it was in the morning hours and I was doing property check and I happened to go down to the gym. And I'm going to go check out the gym, make sure everything's cool. And I'm coming through the back way. I knock, nothing. I hear nothing. Then I knock again. I'm like, okay, Butler, you know, nothing, whatever. I walk in and out walks Victoria, right? <laughs> so instead, out of the freaking sauna room. Remember the big old sauna room yep, that was there? Yeah. Steam room, whatever. And all this steam comes out. I swear it was like a video. It's like all this steam comes out. And there she comes running out butt ass naked music is blasting and she is dancing up a storm I'm like, I'm like i'm in shock i'm freaking out i'm like oh my god oh my god i'm gonna get so fired i'm done i'm done i go i'm so sorry i'm sorry sorry and i freak out and i like go back and i shut the door and i go running back up so victoria comes back into the butler pantry afterwards right <laughs> and i see her and i go i am so sorry i apologize and she's laughing enough she goes oh 
don't worry, darling. You know you just like to look at my bum. <laughs> <laughs> She, not she, was, she, she was just a, such a fun personality, you know, she, she was, was really down to earth and cool. And uh, yeah, no, I never got in trouble for that. And well, I didn't do anything wrong, but no, happened. no. Oh, yeah. so Jen, yeah, yeah. Uh, come on, Stop. man. <laughs> dish it out. Dish it out. It's dish dish. Story. Oh, such a colorful story too. Um, I don't know where to even start. I mean, I guess I, I always knew I was going to be discovered for something, even when I was a kid. So I, would always, I always have worn makeup and done my hair. And even to this day, like I won't go to the mailbox unless I'm ready to have a photo taken of me. Right. Which is time consuming. But (laughs) (laughs) when I, when I went to LA, I worked for Bloomingdale's for years and years. And it was just like, you're just spinning your wheels, you know, and now I'm in LA and I had always, I had always subscribed to Playboy for some reason because I wanted to see if it would ever be like a possibility because there there was the era of like the fake boobs and, you know, the hair extensions and you just like nothing was real and I haven't had any work done. So I'm like, well, this isn't the time to apply because clearly I'm not what they're looking for. So I watched this movie that you might have heard of, The Secret. Oh, yeah. I, it really resonated with me. I'm like, maybe it's something that I need to make happen for myself. But if it's meant to be, it's going to come to me. I just have to will it to be. So I was like, this is going to be the true test. So every morning I would wake up and I'd look in the mirror and I'd say, I'm going to be in Playboy. So a couple weeks of saying that every single day. Now, meantime, Steel Panther was like the thing to do in Hollywood every Monday night. That's where I went for years, right? So I used to get up on literally the best. So I'm from Jersey. We know that like girls in Jersey back in those days knew how to flash for free beers, right? So (laughs) I was no, (laughs) I was no stranger. So like, I was just comfortable with, you know, I've had a few, everything goes out the window, like whatever. So the lead singer would always pull me up on stage And I'd flash the crowd and everyone would go wild. And it was like the two seconds of like, oh, everybody loves me. And then, you know, you get the free drink or whatever. And, you know, you go on about your week, you do it again next Monday. Well, ends up being that the drummer's friend worked at the mansion and found me outside in the parking lot after one of the shows. And the drummer is like, listen, Please, like, please don't think this is weird. Like, my friend wants to ask you a question. I have nothing to do with this. Just hear him out. So he's like, I work for Playboy. Would you ever consider, like, being a Playboy? And gives me his business card that has, like, it's like an official. I'm like, this, this can't even be, <laughs> this can't even be happening, right? So who is that? I was like, okay. Yeah, um, who was it? It was Matt Chin. Yeah, Matt Chin from the kitchen. Yeah, right? yeah. So I gave him pictures. The next week, which I guess he then gave to Holly. And then the the next week. So Panther was like the meetup every week to like keep the ball rolling. And then I got a handwritten note on the HMH like notepad, Holly's name and phone number to the to the studio. So I called and I went in for Polaroids and the rest is history. So flashing on stage at a metal show seemed to work out for me. (laughs) And Matt and Matt made some cash. They, they put it out yeah. to all staff that, hey, if you see someone that you think would be like perfect to be a playmate, you know, you give out and discover them. Yeah. You would get a discovering fee. Yeah. I think he I think he told me at that point in time, he was the only like staff person that had ever actually gotten someone into the magazine. So he was the first one to ever get that. And I think he used it to go to like the big soccer thing. It's like the Super Bowl for soccer. Yeah. Cup. Yeah. I, I, I believe he used the money to like go do that, which was like oh, really wow. cool for him. Yeah. Okay. He's such a sweetheart. Love him to death. How long, how long did it take from when you went in, you sent in pictures to when you actually went into the studio shooting? So. Like, did you do a test shoot first? I did do a test shoot first. I, I want to say this all happened in 2000. Eight, and then I probably did the test shoot in like June. And because I remember doing the test and going up to the mansion every week 
for like the whole summer and just thinking like today's going to be the day he's going to tell me that I'm in or like someone's going to tell me that I'm in. So it's like you do that and you're just waiting for your, your test to be approved to go forward. And I would go out for dinner and Holly would have me like sit at the table with them. And I could see her always like whispering in his ear. And, and every time I would go think it was the day and then it didn't happen. And then I'd go home like, oh, you're just dragging. Like, I want to be a part of this family so bad, but I just ne- needed that next step. And I remember one day I just, I, I was just so mentally like exhausted from waiting to find out that I left work early. I was sitting in my car at the parking lot at Century City, like where we, we would park d- down the street from the mall. I, I got a text from Holly, like, good news, he approved your test. And like, it was like, God was like making me <laughs> like really want that. And I was like, I'm just, I had to give, I'm like, whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. But I can't, I can't keep putting this much emotional weight in it anymore. So like, it stops here. And then as soon as I said that to myself, the text came through. Wow. She's like, get ready. We're like, we're going to schedule your, your like shoot. And I'm like, oh my God, this went from like, this might not happen to like, oh, it's happening so fast. And how long from like when you became playmate, I mean, obviously you were probably coming up and staying in the guest house, but when did that change to where you actually moved into the bunny house down the street? I never stayed in the guest because I lived out there. So I never needed to really stay. I would just oh, drive. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. It was probably my issue came out 2009 and I moved into the bunny house in 2010, like around February. So I was like a year and that was, that was a wonderful experience. Also, it was, it's so weird how you can manifest yourself into something so completely like it was like Alice in Wonderland almost. Who who was your makeup artist? Uh, Sarah. Oh, Sarah okay. Kana. Yeah, I loved her. She was amazing. Amazing. It was just such a great experience. Arnie was my photographer. It was How long really did you great shoot? Tag. Yeah, very cool, dude. Mm-hmm. Gotta get him. You know, it, it's funny to hear you both, right? Like Victoria, you earlier talked about how you stayed in the guest house at the mansion. You moved into the bunny house down the street from the mansion. Mm-hmm. But the guest house actually had a transformation. Victoria, yeah. you came in, it was when at least you looked like a, like a cabin. <laughs> right. Well, I, was, I did was, stay, was, yeah, was I stayed there a couple of weeks, but it was only for like two weeks, like before I moved into the bunny house. So I did, I did have a little stay there, which was. Holly uh, did a number on that. She did a whole remodel on that. Oh, and wow. she, yeah, she made it look really cute and like livable. It was a little crunchy before that. It was kind of dark, right? Cause the walls <laughs> were wood paneling and the blankets were, it did not feel mansion like, you know, when I, when I was staying there, I was, it was a little like, and it's all trees around. So it's just, you know, you got to kind of, when you walk in there, it's kind of, you're going down into the, into the doorway or whatever. So I felt a little nervous cause I was, I felt so separated from everything else at the mansion. It's kind of way off by the tennis court, but, but I lived in Woodland Hills at the time and they insisted that I stay there. They must've oh. felt I well, would show up on time. It makes sense because it was easier to get ladies on time because yeah. time is right. money. So yeah, cool. they knew you were home. They knew the car would be there. They'd pick you up. But also back in, the, in those days, the guest house didn't have as many rooms as when Victoria, when you came in, it only had a few rooms. And it was actually the main area was uh, work where Scrapbook was at. I mean, really? oh. yeah, Scrapbook was there. So the so I uh, forgot what her name was. But Steve, Steve Martinez would be there and his assistant, and they used to work right there in the, in the I don't know if you'd call it the living room, because there was the uh, fireplace that was there that all yeah. would be transformed. It's crazy. I mean, Holly did really do a good job on that. Yeah. And she even put some of my artwork in there because I had given her some artwork. And so she had some of my artwork in there. So I thought, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, she made it bright. She made it white and yeah. bright. Like happy and it looked like a Barbie house afterwards. It looked like a Barbie yeah. house. It was yeah. definitely a place you wanted to stay. It was very cool. It was definitely very cool. But when I was there, there was like a computer, and you could log on to your MySpace at the time. Right. Or something yeah, like that. Like MySpace was the thing. <laughs> Julie McCullough was like, I remember her being on the computer, and she's the one that got me onto MySpace. But I got on once it kind of jumped the shark a little bit. Oh, but, nice. Yeah. Yeah, MySpace. That's tragic. What was your song? Did you have like a song? No. I, you know what? Yeah. I was so, conv- I had no idea 
like how to do stuff. Like I, it really took me a long time to like really click in. And then I kind of gave up. And what's his name? Tom had even come up to the mansion. He was, he had. Stop it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Julie was friends with him. Are you kidding me? And everybody so, was friends with him. He everybody was, I know, but he had him up. She brought, I believe she brought him up to the mansion, which was so weird. I remember thinking, oh my God. Yeah. We'll have to ask her about that sometime, how that happened. That's hilarious. All right. Well, we're going to have to take another break. We're going to be right back. Oh my gosh. I guess I'm up. I'm up. Ugh. <laughs> you are listening to Rogue Bunny's Mayhem. The Rogue Bunnies have had some pretty epic in real life events that I'm sure you've all heard about. Wondering how you can be included in our next one? Become a VIP NFT holder. The main benefit of being a VIP is access to our events and lucky for you, there are multiple ways to become one. Purchase a stunning Rogue Bunnies Founder Drop Ordinal minting now at ordinals.roguebunnies.com or own a legendary or epic trading card. Buy one right off of our marketplace or try your luck with a Series 1 trading card pack. Once you own one of these, get verified in our Discord and claim your status. The VIP perks don't end at in real life events. You'll also have priority access to future drops, gated chat channels with the Rogue Bunnies, VIP only online events, and more. Want more details? Visit roguebunnies.com. Then follow the bunny mask and get ready to go rogue. Welcome to the metaverse. We're back. Rogue Bunnies Mayhem. You had a question, Brett? I did. I have a question for Jen. Go, um, Victoria said she kind of wanted Playboy to launch her art career. You were, I don't want to say not old, but for as playmates go, I mean, you were late 20s. She's early 20s. What were you hoping happened after your setup? That's a great question. Um, yeah, because I was I was 28 yeah. when I shot everything. I was 29 when my issue came out. So at that point... I feel like at that point in my life, I had just been in the retail. It like sucked me in like a vortex. I was just stuck in it. And once you're in retail long enough and you don't really go to school to learn how to do something else, you're kind of just stuck there because A, you you make more than most people because if I was in cosmetics, so I was making like a double salary, the store pays you and also the company you work for pays you. So you just you make more money. I was just excited to finally get to travel the world, the jobs that I was doing. And I love modeling. I always loved being behind the camera or in front of the camera. So just being able to do that was so life changing for me because it's just like it's a different level of freedom and you get to be your own person and you're representing yourself basically, which I never really got to do. I always had to ask someone if I could take a day off to go do something for my personal life, you know? So it was very empowering, which was nice for a change at that point. Cause yeah, I was almost 30 and had to ask for a day off for a doctor's appointment. It was crazy. It definitely gave me a little more creative freedom. I want to know how Brian got started though, because. <laughs> yeah. How'd that happen? How did I start at the mansion? Wow. Um, here's pretty much what it is. And, uh, I used to be in a band. My ultimate dream, right, was to be a rock star. That's what I wanted to do. I've known that since I was a kid. I'm talking elementary. I saw Johnny Cash on stage, you know, when I was like nine years old. You have an amazing voice, too. And uh, thank you. And uh, it just, it was weird. It's just how it all landed up. I mean, I literally started as a drummer. I've always been a person that believed in God as a child. You know, I was a born and raised Catholic and then I got into the band and then I got really spiritual, right? I went off, off on this whole tangent, went on this whole thing. And I was like going, you know, I'm going to figure this out, you know? And I started believing all my own bullshit, new wave crap. I mean, new age crap and stuff. And I'm now going, uh, what's going on with my life? Boom, 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 boom. I'm questioning being in the band the whole thing. What am I going to do next? And all of a sudden, this commercial started coming on about broadcasting. And I thought, hmm, radio broadcasting, maybe I can go into radio and I could still use the talents that I've been given. I'm not shy. I know how to speak. Maybe that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do this now for God, right? I'm going to do a broadcasting show. So I'm going to the school down in Huntington Beach, uh, Academy of Radio Broadcasting, and I'm broke as fuck. Okay. I'm sorry. Radio doesn't pay a lot because after I graduate, they hired me 
to be the commercial. I was learning about commercial production and I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool to be like a voiceover artist? I always loved cartoons and I just love voiceover. And I started learning the computer program and everything. And that's what I was doing, but it wasn't paying a lot. So I was a studio counselor at the school and I was bitching to the front office guy, Sean. And I was like, dude, I'm having a hard time. I have no money. Um, I really got to find a secondary job. I just don't know what to do. And he goes, hey, would you be uh, opposed to going around and picking up plates and stuff like that? And I go, what do you mean? Like catering, you know? And he goes, I work at a place where you could go and work parties and all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, that sounds cool. And I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. He goes, all right, well, I'm going to give you a number to call and then give this guy a call, Robert, and let him know that I told you to give him a call and he'll, I'll set it all up. Cool. So I, call, I I wait till I get home and I call and the Robert picks up the phone. He goes, Hey, uh, Robert Gantos, Playboy House office. How can I help you? I go, excuse me. And he, goes, <laughs> and he goes, and I go, where did I just call? And he goes, this is Robert at the Playboy mansion, Playboy house office. How can I help you? And I'm like, click. I literally click the phone. <laughs> I slam the phone down. So it's kind of funny, you know, like you. Yeah, know, same you, thing. Same thing, right? And I'm like, son of a bitch, right? I'm like, I'm poor. I'm not one that likes to pour out my personal stuff to people. But now I did. And now I'm feeling like he made me a joke. So I went into the, to the studio the next day. And I see Sean. And Sean's all, hey, how'd the call go? I'm like, dude, that is messed up. I'm like, what? You're gonna mess with the guy that's trying to like, you know, live his life better. Oh, let's mess with the Christian dude. You know what I mean? And you're gonna have your friend pretend like it's the Playboy Mansion. And he's like, what did you do? I go, I hung up, dude. I'm not gonna fall for this crap. I was pissed. I mean, I was literally yelling. Yeah. He takes me aside in the office. He goes, calm down, calm down. He goes, dude, it's not a joke. Just don't mention anything. I work at the Playboy Mansion on the weekends. I'm like, no, you don't. He goes, yeah, I do. And I go, what? <laughs> I called up Robert. Robert's laughing his ass off at me. He <laughs> John had told him the whole story. And I it literally went this quick. I go, I worked a party. I was told to stay. I thought I was being fired. I worked one party. I was outside sweating my balls off. I mean, I've never worked so hard. Robert and Guy say, hey, we need you to stay. Everybody else is allowed to go. Robert comes up to me and I'm thinking I'm fired. I go, what did I do wrong? I thought I did everything. You know, and he goes, no, 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 no. Calm down, kid. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> there's something about you and we're in a bind. We need to train someone in the house. And I'm like, what? Wow. Okay. He goes, are you available next weekend? Next thing you know, I come in, I meet Fuji, I meet William, uh, you know, I'm in the butler's pantry and they're asking, hey, cool. So how long have you been working here? And I go, I just worked the party last weekend. And Fuji's tripping out. What do you mean? And they show me a paper from Kimberly, the rules of the house, how nobody is allowed to come into the house unless you work like three years outside. Wow. And then no one's allowed to come upstairs unless you work two years in the butler's pantry. Oh, my gosh. It's so nuts to me that. I had such a change of heart within me that I grew to love this family. I mean, literally love this family. I love that man to death. It, it, it's just so cool that, that I have been able to meet so many playmates and they talk to me about like how the different playmates that get together for Bible studies and stuff like that. I'm like, really? My mind was blown. It was like I had such a narrow mindset and it was just like opened up and gosh, Everything changed for me, to, even to the very end where I was leaving and I got to tell I was had a moment with the boss and we just hugged it out. We just hugged it out. He was crying. I was crying. And Aww. I just got to tell him, I go, boss, I'm going to tell you the truth. I honestly believe that, you know, you know, God had me here to come for you to just let you know how much he loves you, man. That gave me chills. Oh, my God. You know, I could go in and dive into all these other stories. But that's really what happened. And the way I got moved into the mansion so quickly from party 
to butler to all of a sudden I was uh, the luncheon butler. I had to go get a job at a restaurant to get some experience as a, as a waiter. And then immediately Robert now got another job. And then there was the uh, audition to get his position. And then immediately, boom, I'm now in his position. And now I'm the guest services assistant manager. And then that moves on up. And then Kimberly really liked me and she immediately brought me up and I was serving the kids ice cream right. and I just got to, I love those boys. I yeah. Love, you got to see them grow up. Yes. And it was like, I remember when I came down and Chris was working the graveyard shift because I, I used to have to fill all the shifts to, to learn how to do the shifts and stuff. And Chris was on a break and Kimberly called down for some ice cream cones and I said, sure. So I made them, whatever. And then she buzzed down again. She goes, what's taking so long to make an ice cream cone? And I just, and I go, oh, well, I'm waiting for Chris to come back from break. I go, she goes, why are you waiting for Chris to come back from break? Because the rules say that I'm not allowed to go upstairs yet. She goes, I said, bring me those ice cream cones. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I took them up, handed them to the boys. The boys loved me and it was so fun. And then I come down and Chris is freaking out. What are you doing? You're not supposed to go upstairs. I'm like, Ma'am, you know, she she, you got the she called down and I and from then that day, boom, I was allowed up and down. So I just saw doors open, boom, 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 boom. I never felt like I was in a wrong place. I was like, if people only knew this yeah. is a, a real gentleman here, he's such a loving, kind man. Maybe people can have different viewpoints of what the philosophy is or how you live your life, but that wasn't for me to judge. I was just there to love on people and I've never shied away from who I am. This is who I am. Yeah. Guess what? And uh, there you go. There's. I have a question for you. Yeah. How much therapy did you give the playmates in the pantry? <laughs> <laughs> how much and how therapy? much money would you have if you had charged for that therapy? <laughs> I mean, how many times did the playmates go to you and like, Inspired in you and like give you, you know, Victoria, that's what was weird. It's like I'm always concerned that, like, did I do a good job? Did I was I a good boss? I never wanted to be someone that would scare anyone off, you know what I mean? I knew that I was there with a purpose to show that people can be good and I'm here if you need to talk. And you're right, Victoria, I was weird. Yeah. It's like so many girls would come in and they'd want it, they just confide in me. Just like, hey, what about this? Or what? Hey, can I talk to you? And they pull me into the med room, right? And the Mediterranean yeah. room was the room right off the butler's pantry. And just tell me their deep, dark, personal stuff. It's not like I ever asked anything. Right, right. They would just confide and go, I don't know what to do. What do you think about this? And I'm thinking, is there like a memo out? Why are everyone <laughs> keep coming to me? Like, you know? Boyfriend problems. Go to the pantry. <laughs> yeah, go go to the pantry. Go talk to Brian. I would just talk with people. Eventually, everyone knew, like all the butlers knew, is like I had a role, like when the, in the house house office, you know, where I had my office at. Anybody was allowed to come in when they knock. Um, I would ask, okay, am I your boss? Am I your friend? Or do you just want me to just to listen? You know what I mean? And I, I yeah. just just listen because you need to vent. And that was the role. And everybody, and then. So many of the playmates would come over and I'd be John Luther, who was the GM, he'd walk in and he'd see some playmates sitting down at, 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 next to me <laughs> at the desk, just confiding about all her stuff. And I'd, I'd console her or talk about what she, you know what I mean? And try to in, encourage her to, to keep moving. And, and John would just look in and go, eh, okay, <laughs> walk out. Because it, it, I never felt it was like I was breaking a fraternization role because I wasn't trying to pick up on anything. Right. I was just trying to be a good person to help people out, you know? Yeah. That's probably why they came to you too, because yeah. most like guys would use that as like the segue to be like, Oh, I would treat you better than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, that's what made it hard. It, it, it got disgusting when I found out a lot of friends or I thought were my friends in the industry would invite me out to things. Cause I didn't really go out much until the later years and find out that they thought, Oh, if I have Brian around, then I've got this in, you know how we do all the steel Panther nights and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And we've talked about that at other shows. And it's just like, I just see girls as like, you know, my sisters, you know what I mean? And we're all right. having fun, but I'd have other guys that would be hanging with me thinking, Oh, well, this is my in. And mm -hmm. that shit used to piss me off. Yeah. Like, what are you doing, dude? I'm like, would you do that? If this was my actual sister He's going to start trying to like, you know, pick up Maybe. on my sister. I go, what are you doing? 
I mean, when the respectful thing come to me and ask me, hey, is this cool or not? You know what I mean? And so yeah. there were a lot of guys I had to get away from. Yeah. Those that would act like they were, oh, well, I'm I'm a manager or I'm a whatever this and that and crap like that. And I just, it just, I found that I like all of a sudden it had all these friends and then I found out that I had no friends. You had to narrow you know? it down. It's very toxic out there. You, it's it's you know. really bad. The best thing about moving away from there was, though, that I really figured out who my actual friends are. That, yeah. you know, I if I come back into town, they're the ones who will drive a couple hours to come have a drink with me at a bar because they want to see me. You know what I mean? And that, it has nothing to do with yeah. me getting on them on a list somewhere. You know, it's genuine friendships. And there's quite a few people out there, which is wonderful. But you really find out who the toxic people are once you can't do anything for them anymore. So true. Mm -hmm. But you know what? All in all, I look back and I think how blessed all of us are that we got to be part of such an iconic time, regardless of your beliefs, that we got to know a man truly for who he was. People can come out and say from their different points of view or whatever, but such a sense of humor. Hilarious, dude. I know. He was very witty. (laughs) Always very witty. Quick, right? Yeah. But he cared about everyone. He cared about everyone enjoying themselves. He managed to make sure that everything was meticulously done so everyone felt comfortable and could have fun. He wanted to make sure that all the, you know, like the buffets and the dinners and the parties and was everything so perfect so everyone can enjoy and and, you know, mix and mingle and talk to each other and the conversations around that timing table. Oh my gosh. If we had a microphone in there, I mean, girls next door barely touched the surface of half the stuff that was going on up there because of course they, they segued the show off about the girls travels and stuff like that. But if they really got the stuff that was going on, you know, on a day to day there, you pretty magical, pretty dang magical. Yeah. Well, there you go, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We are Rogue Bunnies Mayhem. And the The Mayhem mayhem continues. continues.